trouble. Here's one for the non-scientist. Uh, turns out every year that uh, these sandhill cranes come back to a place in Alberta, I believe it is, uh, to set up their nests. <laughs> and there's some people, you know, that watch all these things and make notes of it in their book. So they noted the first arrival of the sandhills. And back in 1965, the first arrivals came right near the end of April. But look as we've gone forward in time, how that arrival date has also got forward in time. So it, it's almost a month earlier now that the Sandys arrive uh, at, at their initial arrival at the breeding grounds. And no matter where you go, you see the same kind of thing. The storks in Europe, um, the swallows in not Capistrano, but Madrid. Uh, there's, there's been hundreds of studies by people that like to look at birds that verify this behavior all around the planet. Uh, well, why is that happening? Presumably, the guys that can get up there first get the best nesting sites, and their young have the best chance of surviving. So they sort of breed hereditarily into this kind of an early arrival um, strategy. Uh, here's one that drove me nuts for the longest time. This is the date of first blooming of a um, uh, poplar type plant. And you know, there was really was somebody back in 1900. This comes from a, a garden club uh, <laughs> book, if you want. Uh, people actually kept track of when these plants first bloomed. And you can see again here that as you go forward in time, this is the days from relative zero. It used to be 20 days or so uh, earlier, but now it's 20 days or 15 days uh, later. So again, almost a month shift in when this particular kind of plant uh, had, had, will first bloom. And uh, again, hundreds of examples like this we could choose from. OK, let's go on to chemistry. <coughs> I hope. Uh, this is a really important picture, and so bear with me because it looks sort of busy, but it's not really. Uh, the time axis is now are hundreds of thousands of years before present, zeros today. And so we get out here, we're half a million years ago. And what we're going to see is the temperature shown here in blue. You see that there's been a lot of changes. Mother Nature really is changeable, that's for sure. And you notice the typical time scale of the change is order of 100,000 years. And uh, we're able to explain these kind of oscillations and do changes in the Earth's orbit around the sun. But that's another story. Uh, also shown on here is the uh, methane concentration. Remember I mentioned methane was such a bad guy. Well, here it is going lockstep with the temperature. Uh, temperature goes up, methane goes up, or vice versa. Uh, here's the same kind of picture for CO2. So you can see the relation between uh, these two greenhouse gases and the surface temperature is, is very dramatic. And um, let's look what happened recently. Here's the methane, the scale down here, 700. All of that scale here, it's all the way off the scale of the chart. There's more methane in the atmosphere now than we've seen in the last uh, half million years. And look how dramatically it seems to go up. Boom, I mean, just right now. And the same thing with the uh, CO2, current CO2 levels here. We haven't seen anything like them in hundreds of thousands of years. So if you believe in the greenhouse gas theory, these levels of greenhouse gases are going to lead to a whopping change in temperature. And I should put in here that this whole greenhouse gas theory came about in the 80, uh, 1880s, 1890s. And uh, nobody refutes the theory. Nobody. I mean, I don't know of another theory that's not refuted somehow. We know that these gases uh, uh, will have certain thermal emission properties. and with more of them, you'll warm up the atmosphere. Um, the data's there for that. In fact, in 1890, somebody computed, what well, clever devil, that uh, the Earth temperature would increase 3 degrees centigrade if you doubled CO2. 3 degrees centigrade. Well, when we run our giant computer models today and say, hey, if we double CO2, what happens? It increases temperature by about 4 degrees centigrade. So uh, you know, this is really established facts and physics that we're dealing with here. Uh, this is a real messy one. I threw it in at the last minute, but I want to make a point because this is another one of these things that scares the hell out of me. Uh, you all know what pH is, a level of acidity. <clears throat> Think of it as the acidity, if you want, uh, of the ocean. And uh, way back in glacial times, a number like 8.3, and uh, pre-industrial, this is the 17, 1800s, 
it's here just a little below 8.2. And so this is sort of the range that you would expect from natural variability. Just Mother Nature doing your thing is going to give us a range in pH of about uh, a tenth of a unit. Uh, here are the measurements we have today, or here. You notice that they are decidedly lower, and there's a lot of scatter to them, but a concentrate here is a good mean value. Uh, it's lower now than it has been uh, really at any time in the last couple of million years. Uh, and here's where we think it's going to go if we double CO2. This is a CO2 increasing curve. Uh, the, the, the oceans will have never seen a pH like that, at least not anything like uh, recent times. By that I mean millions of years. Who cares? Well, these guys care. These are your favorite little planktons. You'll recognize all of your friends here. And this is pictures of what they look like. And half of the plankton in the ocean, <coughs> excuse me, have a calcium base for their uh, for their shells. They're a little think of a little tiny shell like a beach uh, co a cockle or something you pick off a beach. And uh, if you get the pH high enough, like where we'll be in about 30 years, these shells begin to dissolve. And that means that you're taking out roughly potentially half the phytoplankton in the world's oceans. 30 years, they're gone. OK. Um, well, the problem is that they're plants. And like forests, they produce oxygen. And the phytoplankton, we think, uh, produce about 50% of the oxygen uh, to the Earth's atmosphere each year. And what would happen if you took half of that away? That's the bad news. Well, the question mark is, what would replace it? Is there something else that would replace it that maybe didn't generate oxygen or that was fatal to the other half of the phytoplankton that lived? We don't know, but we're talking about a global engineering experiment uh, with a tremendous impact on the substance that we need for life on the planet, and nobody has really got a clue. This doesn't seem to bother anybody, decision makers particularly. Uh, scientists, uh, again, this is something like the permafrost thing. It just scares the hell out of you. OK, so have the phytoplankton populations changed? And this is a, a, a difference between two satellite systems, one from the 80s, one from uh, more recent times. And everywhere you see blue here, the phytoplankton concentrations have become less, uh, as you would expect in, a, in an acidic ocean. There are areas here, particularly right near the coasts, where the productivity of the ocean has actually increased, uh, which is good. Uh, but over the majority of the ocean, when you average it, you find out that there's been about a 6% drop in the amount of uh, phytoplankton uh, in the world's oceans in just 20 years. And we don't have a long enough time series to say if this happens all the time or not. But uh, I think it's a good warning. Okay, a summary, the, the frame that I've tried to make for you is uh, essentially three branches of science, physics, biology and chemistry, all coming together in a common picture. The planet's changing. It's changing dramatically in many different ways. And the single explanation that will explain it all is us, I'm afraid. We're heating the planet up with our emission of greenhouse gases to the extent that it can now be observed in all of the climate uh, system. Um, when we try to reproduce these changes with our climate models, you know, despite what people say, and I'm one of their big critics, they do a pretty darn good job of it. At least we know we got about the right order of magnitude. We're headed in the right direction. And again, if you take a peek up ahead of you, say, oh my god, I don't want to go there. Um, key thing here is uncertainty. During the last administration, the uncertainty in these numbers was used <coughs> as an excuse to do nothing. We don't know what's going to happen. Uh, it's sort of somebody like somebody saying, well, you stand over there at the side of the room and, and let me take a couple of shots at you with this, you know, two-inch barrel gun and I might not get you in the shoulder, I might not get you in the arm, I don't know where I'm going to get you, but I'll get you somewhere. And that's sort of where we're at now. You don't want to fire the gun in the first place. Uh, that's where we are. Okay, now let's flip to the other side and I'll put on my, uh, I hate to spoil a story, but my, uh, I, won't, I won't say it, <laughs> let it go. Uh, if there's all this agreement between theories, if the theory was worked out 200 years ago, 150 years ago, we have all this data that supports it. We have these giant climate models that more or less produce all the stuff that we've, we're seeing now. Then why is there disagreement? 
Why didn't everybody stand up and said, oh my God, this is a global problem, we've got to solve it immediately. What's the argument? And why is there confusion? People are wildly confused about, you know, what the hell's going on out there. And this is where I call them, they have a lot of names, but the professional uh, deniers come in. Um, and um, I think that they come from the world's oldest profession. Uh, you give me money and I'll provide services for you. These are really uh, scurrilous people, in my view. So here are some of the arguments. I call it mess because I'll show you that they all are a bunch of uh, baloney. The measurements of temperature are bad. Okay. They're giving us the wrong reason. <clears throat> climate gate. I don't know if any of you remember climate gate from uh, a couple of years back. Talk about that briefly. Um, oh, it's the sun. That's the favorite one. It's got to be the sun's doing this. Uh, one I like is cosmic rays. Change the cosmic ray bombardment of the Earth, and you generate more or less clouds. Change this climate. Uh, the other big favorite, however, is Mother Nature. Hey, look, this has been going on forever, so what are you worried about? Uh, and then there are guys that playing out lies, I'll show you. There's been no warming in the last 10 years. What are you guys telling me about global warming? Nonsense. Uh, the one that is most confusing to lay people is that uh, you know, your, your local weather colors your view of what the environment is. So uh, as we'll see, if you have a couple of real snowy periods, uh, the tendency is to say, this can't be global warming, right? Because there's too much snow. It's, what's going on here? Uh, and then finally, there's only a very small group of people that run around and make these points. Who are these guys? Let's take a look at them. OK, uh, let's look at the instrumentation, instrumentation business. Uh, a thermometer is put in this little cage here. And you'll notice right next to it are big uh, condensers for air conditioning. Well, clearly, they're going to impact this, this uh, thermometer in there. And uh, these people went around, did a big study, and said, see, half the stations in the world uh, have this kind of problem or worse, and they're simply not reliable. Well, uh, the American Meteorological Society got together a, a team, and they studied this. They went and divided the data into what I call simply good data and bad data. Don't worry how the definition was made. And they looked at maximum temperatures. And with a good data set, they computed what the uh, northern hemisphere maximum temperatures would be over this 20 some odd year period. And what do you know, straight line. <clears throat> and they took the poor data that they classified separately and did the same calculation. Hard to see much difference there, isn't it? So it didn't make any difference which of the data sets they used. Uh, in the end, they both gave the same answer. OK, climate gate. Uh, this is one of my big deal. Uh, um, the email system at the University of East Anglia was hacked into about two weeks, three weeks before the last big climate meeting of the, all the nations in Copenhagen. And uh, I have a lot of friends that had their email hacked. And uh, you know, they never know who did it, of course. But they were sometimes not very friendly in their emails to these uh, denier people, the ones that made up all this baloney. Uh, and so that reflected in the emails. Uh, no dirty language that I could tell. But nonetheless, it was not very nice. Not very smart. So the denier, denier said that this is all a giant conspiracy between you climate guys like me. And uh, by golly, you fudge the data to get all these numbers that you get. Well, let, let's take a look at that here. Uh, <clears throat> Had crew, wonderful name, is the blue line. This again is the uh, global temperature based on their analysis. And you can see it goes up here pretty rapidly. Uh, NOAA did the same thing. Uh, NASA did the same thing, and the Japanese Meteorological Agency did the same calculations with different data sets. And what do you know? They all got the same answer. So the climate gate business had nothing to do with the science whatsoever. It really represented a personal attack on the people who are doing the research. And a lot of us don't like that very well. Uh, OK, let's do the sun, the cosmic way thing, or well, cosmic ray business. <clears throat> this, again, is another. Uh, crunch down picture of the uh, uh, ocean temperature, or uh, land ocean temperatures. And again, the thing you see is a sh sharp, abrupt increase here in about 1940, or whatever it is, I can't read it from here. So we're looking for something that has that signature. Can we find a curve that looks like this, but that represented the output from the sun, say? Well, here is one based on sunspot cycle. And you can see it does start